Hey, good morning. It is Sunday, August 9th, and our teaching text comes from Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. These are the words of Jesus. He said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? I'll tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Last week, we talked about cultivating discernment in an age of deception. And we said that to deceive is to cause one to believe something that's not true, typically to gain personal advantage. And this week, we're going to have a related conversation on self-deception and the way of Jesus. Self-deception and the way of Jesus. If to deceive is to cause someone else to believe something that's untrue, self-deception is allowing oneself to believe that a false or unvalidated feeling, idea, or situation is true. Allowing yourself to believe something that's not true. A timeless story of self-deception is the emperor's new clothes. You know, I'll know the story of the emperor walking down the street, buck naked, allowing himself to believe the lie that he's wearing this, this latest new fashion, this invisible fabric, and everyone can see uh, right before them his nakedness and they're chuckling behind his back. In this passage in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus depicts a, a, like a judgment day scenario in which people who seem to speak fluent Christianese and people who demonstrate familiarity with Jesus and who have a fairly impressive track record of deeds of power done in Jesus' name. I mean, they list examples of like prophesying and driving out demons and performing miracles. Like these are A-listers that Jesus is talking about. That these A-listers are denied entry to the kingdom and told by Jesus, I'm sorry, you're not on the list. I don't have a clue who you are. The sobering reality as we reflect on the words of Jesus here is that we don't appear to be talking about heretics and charlatans. We, atteem, we, we appear to be talking about successful Christians, maybe even like professional Christians, people like me who are often behind microphones. The people who have, you know, kind of been there and done that. We're talking Sunday school teachers and missionaries and preachers. We're talking about the the big authors and evangelists and conference speakers and church board members. It's people who have a decent list of bona fides that they're impressed with and they think that Jesus should also be impressed with. And you can hear their tone as twice they say, Lord, Lord. There's desperation there, like, whoa, 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 Jesus, hold on. Like, let's press pause. You appear to be confused about this. You've got something wrong. They're keenly aware of their own, uh, the, the caliber of their own spiritual devotion. Uh, their impressive history of victories rolls off the tongue as if it's not their first time to list it out in succession and then stand back in awe. In the words of Dale Bruner, we learn that it is possible to work for Jesus and yet not live under him. We can be intoxicated by the power of Jesus and yet be hostile to his hard commands. These people believe that they know Jesus, but apparently they never gave him a chance to know them. It turns out that doing God's work can be a self-deceiving way of avoiding the work that God wants to do in you. That doing God's work can be a self-deceiving way of avoiding the work that God wants to do in you. It turns out that it's easier to exercise the demon in you than to come face to face with the demon in me. That it's easier to care for those people who are in poverty than to come to grips with my own spiritual poverty. That it's easier to commend to others the way of Jesus than to actually take the narrow path and follow him myself. Now, while this teaching should scare and sober up those people who uh, busy themselves with God's work, in a backwards way, it's actually good news for the rest of us who've never done great things for God. The people who don't have a trophy case full of spiritual wins or a proven history of great feats of strength done in Jesus' name. In the context of the Sermon on the Mount, which we've studied for nearly eight months now, and which we're going to wrap up uh, next week, 
we can appreciate that absolutely nowhere in the Sermon on the Mount has Jesus commanded or expected his followers to drive out demons or to prophesy or to perform miracles. Now, we could certainly go to other passages in the New Testament, but in the context of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' uh, principal teaching here in Matthew 5 through 7, he never commands these behaviors that these super Christians flout as their bona fides to get into the kingdom of God. In fact, as you may recall, the Sermon on the Mount begins not with a, a minimum list of entry requirements for the kingdom of God, but with an announcement of who are the principal beneficiaries of the kingdom of God. And it's those who are spiritually down on their luck and impoverished. It's those who mourn and are in grief. It's, it's the meek. It's those who are hungry for God and on and on. It's not the people you would expect. And it's not the people who are impressed with themselves here in Matthew chapter 7. Entry to the kingdom of God does not require superhero status, and spiritual superhero status can actually be a false indicator of, of kingdom citizenship. And so as a result of this and applying this to our thinking, I could say do not regard as saints those who merely preach with eloquence or those who lead numerically successful ministries or who tweet a steady stream of mic droppers, or who make the bestseller list for New York Times or Amazon. But instead, regard as, as saints and hold in high esteem those who speak candidly about their own spiritual destitution apart from Christ. Those who invite the Holy Spirit into their battle with lust or anger or conflict in the Christian community who labor to love their enemies and bless those who sully their name in the public square, who strive to keep their word and repent and aim to repair when they fail to do so, whose private life is on a trajectory toward this antiquated idea of holiness and whose public life betrays no greedy longing for fame or acclaim or status. Such people demonstrate an inner transformation, a Christo-formed manner of being that can only come from proximity to Jesus. Such people can say that they know the Lord, and about such people, Jesus will say, I knew her well, and I knew him well. Jesus says in the passage here, only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. It harkens back to uh, the Lord's prayer. May your kingdom come and your will be done. He says, only do those who do the will of my Father in heaven will enter the kingdom of heaven. In John chapter 6, Jesus was asked the question, what is the work that God requires? And in our context, we can ask, well, if it's not demon casting or prophesying or miracle working, what is it that God wants from us? And Jesus responded in John chapter 6. He said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And belief here, as in all the New Testament, is not merely mentally ascribing to a set of theoretical theological principles. It's not a matter of saying magic words or signing on the dotted line. It's not about agreeing to volunteer with the youth group or to go on a mission trip. That's not the, the, the full extent of what belief looks like. When Jesus says to believe in the one he has sent, it means in your heart of hearts, at the core of your person to say, I am in for everything that God is doing in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And with God's help, I intend to live with him, learning from him how to live under his rule. It's saying, with God's help, I aspire to know and love God with all of my heart and soul and mind and strength, and also to, to be known by God and loved by God in a relationship. It's embracing the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings of Jesus as our curriculum and our rubric for the Christian life. It's not a one-time decision and then a status that you maintain for a lifetime. It's more like hopping on a moving train. It's a pilgrimage. It's a cross-carrying journey. It's, as Nietzsche said, and was repurposed by Eugene Peterson, it's a long obedience in the same direction, following after and walking with Jesus 
through the Holy Spirit, coming to know him and letting him know and transform us. And when you come to see Christianity through these particular lens, as we've defined it, and not merely as a frenzied busyness with religious activities or channeling religious ideology through political conservatism or progressive activism, you can begin to perceive the Grand Canyon-sized gap between the two. And you can begin to understand why Jesus could say to these spiritually elite I'm sorry, I never knew you. As we turn the camera from the text and from these people back on ourselves, we could, I could ask you, do you know him? Uh, Does he know you? Do you want to know him? Are you aware of ways that you've been active for God, but you've not like submitted yourself to God? Are you inviting him into the dark recesses of your own heart? Are you inviting him to know you and to heal you and to shape you into the image of his son? And if you're a person who wants to, or maybe this has been your model of being, I would advise you, if this is something that you desire for yourself, I would advise you to, with humility and sobriety, announce your intention to the Lord. I want to be a person who knows you and is known by you. And ask for his help. Ask him and ask your brothers and sisters in Christ to point out those blind spot, blind spots, areas in which you might be prone to self-deception. Invite the Holy Spirit to do this work in you. None of us want to be the emperor walking down the street with flaws and failures and hypocrisies that are evident to the world but hidden from us, self-deceived. Instead, we want to be people who, cognizant of our need for grace, we come to Jesus and ask him to help put us back together, to know him over the course of the pilgrimage of the Christian journey, to be known by him, to have a a history with him of, of bumps and bruises and healings and joys and victories putting first our being with him and letting our doing follow our being as we come to proximity with him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I want to ask that you would deliver us from self-deception. I ask that by your Holy Spirit, you would do such a mighty work in our hearts, that there would be no corner, no closet of our hearts that is uninspected by your spirit. May we be people who, like First John, like eagerly desire to come into the light as you are in the light so that we can have fellowship with one another and be purified by the blood shed by Jesus on the cross. Pray that you'd be, help us to be people who aspire to live in the light, who aspire to live by the truth, who invite you into uh, our lives to be known by you, for you to know us. Help us on the day when you appear, Lord Jesus, and you come in glory to judge the nations, to be like a, a friendly family reunion, where we see the one that our heart has desired and our heart has loved, the one that we've walked with by faith, no longer seeing through a glass dimly, but finally seeing face to face. Would you give us the grace and the grit to follow you through the pilgrimage in this age, that in the age to come, may we, we, that we may enjoy your presence forever. We love you. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, friends, if you don't know this, uh, we worship together every Sunday at 915 out on our front lawn. If you're in the Tulsa area, area we would love to invite you. Bring a lawn chair, bring a blanket, bring an umbrella uh, for a 45-minute long service, chance to worship with other people who are following Jesus in town. And if you're not in the Tulsa area, I hope that you'll find a church near you to plug in. God bless you. God loves you. Friends, we'll see you around. <laughs>